I, I, looks like this is pretty sensitive as to where I hold it, so I'll try and keep it even tonight. So good evening and welcome to the November 2015 edition of the Mill Valley Historical Society's first Wednesday speaker program. I'm Bill Stock, I'm the president of the society, and it will be my pleasure to introduce your speaker tonight. As you know, your speaker, singer, songwriter, and keyboardist and Mill Valley native, uh, Bill Champlin is here tonight to talk with you. Tonight we have what's probably the most highly attended one of these events at the library. So thank you very much for being here. And because it's so well attended, I assume that most of you know Bill Champlin and the body of his work. So I'm gonna keep my introductory comments short, which I'm sure you'll appreciate. But first, a couple of opening comments. First, I wanna thank the Mill Valley Library, as I always do, because I always should, and they deserve that because of all of the great cultural events they put on, including this one. I wanna also point out that Bill has, has participated in another library partnership program with us, which is the um, history, or, excuse me, the oral history project. And uh, he's completed that, and we have this year, I can't remember the exact count, but it's north of 50 oral histories that we recorded, and we're still on track to go north of that. Um, also in the audience, we have some other people who have participated in that, including uh, Charlie Kelly, who's here, um, Joe Breeze, and Steve Potts. And I'm sure there's others in here I'm not recognizing, but thank you for participating in that. It's, it's great for the long-term history of Mill Valley to record the history of people who've made a difference in this town. Also, as I'm sure you've seen at the front door, Mill, the uh, Historical Society is a membership-driven organization. And so if you want to join our organization, if you haven't already gotten the information, that's available at the door. So on to logistics for the evening. For those of you who haven't attended these events in the past, we do have a kind of a tight schedule to keep. We're at 7.30 right now. We're gonna go until about 8.45, but then we have to end the program. And depending on how it goes, we may have Q&A at the end, or the, the show may continue to flow through its natural progression, but we're gonna have to end at 8.45. And as you, you can also see, there's a lot of chairs and equipment and stuff that are gonna have to be put away, so two things. One is if you can help put that away, that would be helpful. If you can't, please, <laughs> thank you. Um, please exit the, the room as quickly as possible so that those that are putting the equipment away can do that so that we can close the library down on schedule. So those are the logistics. And now on to our speaker. So Bill Champlin attended school in Mill Valley, including Edna McGuire and Tam High. At Tam High, he formed the band The Opposite Six. He later formed the groundbreaking band The Sons of Champlin in the 60s, through which he and his band had a profound effect on music emerging from the Bay Area. Following the, sound, the Sons of Champlin, he performed with many top groups and artists, eventually joining the, the group Chicago. He spent 28 years with Chicago, uh, not only performing, but also writing some of their best known hits, including Hard Habit to Break and the 1988 Song of the Year, Look Away. Following his time with Chicago, he has now emerged himself, excuse me, immersed himself in projects that allow him to express his own particular musical voice. Over his career, Bill has probably written or sung over 400 songs and has won many awards, and as I'm sure you've seen some from the publicity, including two Grammys, but most importantly, the Millie he won here in Mill Valley. <laughs> so thank you for that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to him because you've heard enough from you. Actually, no, you, before you start, Bill, I, I want to recognize you turned me off. <laughs> I want to thank you and your wife, Tamara, for driving up from L.A. So thank you very much for doing that for this program. <laughs> I also want to recognize a couple of other people in, in, the, in the crowd tonight. And I'm sure I can't mention everybody, but Bob Greenwood and his wife, Evelyn, who is an early musical teacher for Bill, and an early influence that launched him on his, his musical trajectory. Tim Kane, who's also here tonight, Charlie Kelly, and others who I've already mentioned. So thanks so much for being here, and all of you too. And with that, take it away. Thank you. Give it up for Bill. 
Now, Bill, go on, get out of here. There's only one Bill on the stage allowed. And I don't see the phone bill anywhere, so I guess it's me. Uh, hey, thanks for coming by. This is something uh, I'll probably go for a minute and I'll talk, and the next thing you know, my, I'll just my I'll get marble mouth and it'll go away real quick. But I'm not used to talking. I'm used to I can sing forever, but I'm not used to talking very much. So I want to. We were we were thinking about mostly when we were driving up today. We were kind of thinking about. Why did this little town right here, Mill Valley, I mean, I, was, I think I moved to Mill Valley from Santa Barbara in 1832, 33, I'm not, I'm not that old, but uh, uh, quite a while ago, and, and I just, it just always blew my mind that this little white town was so damn soulful. I mean, there was just, there was so much cool music that's come out of this neck of the woods. And I figured, it's just, is it the water? Is there something in the water? What is it? Is there something in the... And, and it finally kind of dawned on me that one of the things that we really owe, at least my generation we owed a lot to, was this, if, if you've ever come across the Bay Bridge and you're going through the toll bridge, over on the right there was a radio tower, uh, uh, and it was KDIA uh, uh, radio. It was an a AM station. It was long before FM happened. It was an AM station, and we all listen to that station like it was like the voice of God. I mean, we just, I mean, I discovered Lou Rawls there, and if anybody knows my voice, they can go, <laughs> no, you never heard Lou Rawls at all, did he? You know, uh, it's one of my favorite singers, and, 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 and there was Village Music over here, always had records that you, you know, you couldn't even find in Berkeley. You couldn't find them in Oakland. Uh, there, were, there was things going on around here that kind of allowed people to hear music that was... Uh, was just awesome. It was just so awesome to be a young, you know, braces, pimples, fat, you name it. I was had it all. And man, I was just, I'd listen to Lou Rawls singing, you know, uh, I was born in a dove. You know, it's like, oh God, that is so sexy and soulful and happening. I mean, I'd come home from high school every day and put those two records on, Tobacco Road and Black and Blue, and learned every single note that guy sang and how he fell off the notes and everything about it. And I think that was one of the things that, that kind of got me. And people say, man, I've, I'm into Champlin's phrasing. I said, no, you're into Lou's phrasing. You just heard it from me first, you know. And I'm sure, and Lou listened to, you know, I, I became friends with Lou once I got to L.A. and actually finally worked with him a couple times. And uh, it was such a, such a fun guy with that big, giant voice. You'll never find another love like one. Just this big. And this guy's about this tall. And when he laughed, it sounded like this squeaky little laugh like a squirrel, you know, but it, and he laughed a lot. It was a very, really nutty guy. But we, we, always, had, we always had fun together, and, and he, was, uh, he was like into Arthur Prysock and Ernie Andrews and some of the earlier singers like before that. And they were into, you know, there was just, there was just a whole, there's a whole thing of, of somehow getting people to hear stuff that really makes a lot of sense. A lot of the kids now really just discovered a guy named D'Angelo about maybe 10 years ago. And all, all, most of the singers that are singing in the, black, in the black music scene right now are way off into D'Angelo, just the same way I was into Lou Rawls. And one of the reasons why is D'Angelo backphrases everything to the point where he shifts them on Pro Tools back a little bit. They sound like they're almost almost dragging to the rest of the band, but it just makes it even funkier. And I, that's what I always loved about Lou is he could... You can just backphrase that stuff and just tear you up, you know. And uh, by the way, this I would I'm gonna probably talk more about music than you know culture, <laughs> literary, you know, liter, you know, literature, uh, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's about the only thing I know. You know, I can't even get gas into my car. Are you kidding me? I'll just give me a keyboard and a guitar and I'll be fine, you know. But I was I was caught up in that, and it was just a real real rush. So when I was about I want to say about 13, I moved, to, I moved to town from Santa Barbara, went to Edna McGuire School, and I started just looking around going to these little sock hops, and I, I think the first band I saw was a group called the Ramrods. If anybody remember those guys? Do you, <laughs> somebody remember Scott Hale, Bob Albacton? I think I almost remember all the guys that were in that band. Uh, those guys were happening before, and they were like the sec considered the second generation. That Custom Keys was the first generation of really, really, you know, hip, 
kind of rock and roll with some chops. They had serious chops going on. And Johnny Allaire was in that band. Dean Ferguson, I think, was in that band. And then, and then all of a sudden, the band that we really, um, Tim and I were, were playing. And uh, Tim Kane, by the way, he's right over here. He, he and I started the Suns together. And we were also, we were, which really kind of cool, we were also in the, the Opposite Six, which is a band we had when I was in high school. Tim went to Drake. He went up. He really lived in the white neck of the woods. I mean, seriously, we just look up there's a boy. Whew, hurts my eyes. Anyway, but because uh, uh, at least down here we had a lot of a lot of different things going on. There's a lot of music coming up from Marin City. There was there was just a little different scene in Mill Valley that that was just a change from the next town over. The change from Sausalito. It was a change from uh, Corte Madera, or Redwood High School, or or Drake High School. There's something about Tam that was. It's funky. It was just something funky, and it just and like I say, it was like something in the water. But uh, the custom keys used to play Browns Hall on Miller Avenue like all the time, and then then they then they kind of branched off into another band called the Chord Lords. Now, when I heard the Chord Lords, that was ridiculous. I mean, I, I'd never heard the custom keys. I never got into one of their gigs. By the time I moved here, they were just about done, and the Chord Lords came on. We used to go see Tim and I would go see the Chord Lords. I had this bass player in the band named Rob Noitoza, and this is Rob right here, everybody. Put your hand up, Rob. So, and somehow, you know, we just looked up to these guys sort of like the way we, you know, you would look up to, you know, a king or a queen or something. This guy's just an amazing bass player. He's such a cool guy. What a, what a monster. And he'll talk to you. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> it was really cool. And, you know, it was a, a period of time there. Somehow we started doing different stuff, and the next thing you know, we were hanging with Rob. And Rob taught me so much music, and he's the guy that turned me on to KDIA, because before that, all I wanted to be was a pop singer. I want to be a pop singer. I don't care if I sound like Jerry and the Pacemakers. I want to be a pop singer. And Rob, in one week, he was a real record collector. I mean, he I guess, I don't know, I don't know how he did it, but he uh, had millions of records. And in one week, he turned me on to James Brown, Live at the Apollo, Lightning Hopkins, and uh, Ornette Coleman. <laughs> it's, uh, just it's, 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 it's totally eclectic music. And, and I was just, uh, you know, just in a week of just sitting in Rob's room up there on Cushing Drive, just going, oh, my God, where did this stuff come from? This is unbelievable. And this was like you know, maybe my first couple of years of high school. And the next thing you know, we were playing in a band together, and we were just, we just had a ball. And what was going on at the time is, especially you know, after hearing the the, the blues. I mean, uh, suddenly the blues was, you know, you had to learn a little bit about it. But once you heard it, it was like, oh, oh, this stuff is this stuff has got something that none of no, none of my mom and dad are gonna give me. I'm not gonna get this from mom and dad because I mean, this 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 community at the time was, it was kind of an up a little bit upscale a little bit eclectic, a little bit eccentric in a lot of ways, but not bluesy, you know? It, it just didn't, it's like they say there's rules to the blues. If your name is Troy or Todd, you can't have the blues. Even if you just killed a guy in Memphis, you know? Uh, if, if you drive a Saab or a Volvo, you can't have the blues. I was doing an orchestral gig in Norway and I did that joke and the whole orchestra got up and left. <laughs> Let's come back, guys. You know, give me a break. It was funny. They 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 had me pegged. They knew it. They knew it was coming, and they just went for it. But uh, anyway, we you know we can talk about the blues. I mean, it's you know we just know that one of the great great blues players of all time, players and singers. And I think even more singer than player, just passed away in the last year. BB King is no longer with us. And I, I played with him one time. We did a Suns gig at the. Uh, at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, where they used to have the Grammys and stuff. And, and it was the Yardbirds, B.B. King, Sons of Champlin. And B.B. had, at the time, he had a guy named Duke Jethro playing bass pedals with the organ, with a Hammond organ. They were going to use my organ, and he was going to put his pedals in, and they were going to do their set. Our organ blew a fuse right after our first set, so they couldn't have an organ. So the... the um, the promoter comes upstairs after our set. Somebody went out for a fuse, and they got one, but it wasn't, you know, not in time to get BB's guys on stage. And somebody came up and says, hey, BB's got a, he needs a bass player. And so our bass player, Al Strong, who was a great bass player for the Suns, he was really good, but he went over to get, he had an Ampeg fretless bass. Luckily, it had dots. So he went over to get the bass, and I said, Al, let me ask a question. Have you ever heard of B.B. King? He said, no. I said, Have you, can you name me one of B.B. King's songs? He said, no. I said, give me that. So I went down, 
went down and played a set with BB and two horn players and Sonny Freeman on the drums. And I've, to this day, I've I've received two Grammys and two uh, MVPs from Neris, and I've done played for a half a million people. Nothing did it to me like doing that show on an instrument. I'm not even really that much of a player. But it was just being with B.B. And B.B. was such a sweet, sweet person, such a great guy. It was like you could see why that guy hung as long as he did. He stayed stayed in the ball game as long as he did. One of the best singers, really, in his heyday, one of the best singers ever. But since we're talking about blues, let's play some. Do you mind? Because, I mean, if we're going to talk about music, I'm going to play some music. It's just as simple as that. So, uh, you know, I want to bring up Rob to, to, to play along with me because Rob not only is a great bass player, Rob is a screamingly great singer and a cool, cool harp player. So let's do a couple things. You want to? See. Give me an A. Here's four of them. Take your pick. Lovely. Oh, this might be what the problem is. Oh, it's this thing. Give me a second. Charlie. <laughs> So Give it a minute. It'll be. This won't happen forever. That ain't gonna work. That's full. That's bullshit. That's the blues, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I got other chords. I think it's. I think it's a good. I think it's a guitar. Something tells me. Tell your old mama. Tell your sister. Everybody spread the news If you're wondering about the change in Papa Papa's learned to play the blues Papa's learned to play the blues Papa went looking for a hobby yard. Then he went to hear B.B. King he drank some apple juice in the lobby Now he's doing a whole new thing Papa's doing a whole new thing When he sings this song it Makes you want to sing along When he bends those notes Whole room floats away, Papa play, Papa. Rock and roll band 
Lord, what happened to our dear old dad? When he sings this song, he makes you wanna sing along. When he bends those notes, the whole room floats away. Pop a play. Oh, Rob's gonna sing one. I will. I'm really honored that my old friend Bill asked me to come up and sing tonight and do a blues. So. But I decided, you know, I've done, I've got my mojo working and, you know, all those songs for years and years. I decided, why don't I just write something? So I got to read this because I just wrote it about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Well, I grew up in Mill Valley, <laughs> a few blocks away from my old friend Bill. Well, I grew up in Mill Valley, just a few blocks away from my old friend Bill. Well, he lived in a house down on Blythdale And I lived way up on the hill Now I got a new friend named Deborah Schwartz. Where is she? <laughs> she bought a house in Marin Yes, I've got a new friend named Deborah now. She bought a house in Marin. Well, I knew that house looked familiar. It was the same house I grew up in. Yeah, she bought my house, folks. <laughs> Wait a minute, Bill, because I got to find out where my words are here. <laughs> See, Intent. this is what happens when you get old, you know. <laughs> I never get old. <laughs> I know tonight is very special because Bill and I both paid our dues. Yeah, we played a, paid him a few times, I think. Not at this library. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> tonight is very special Cause Bill and I have both paid our dues And so Bill, I wanna thank you so much For letting me sing these old Mill Valley blues Rob Moitosen. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. <laughs> I knew you were up to something. It, it's, you know what? While this thing's working, before it goes out completely, let me do a few more things. Tamara, you want to sing something? And this is kind of in a bluesy sort of vein. This is a newer song. And, uh, and I'm going to bring Tamara up. If, 
somebody came up to her at a son's gig one time and said, are you Bill's daughter? And I said, or it's, they came up to me and said, is that your daughter? I said, oh, God, go, go, go tell her that. She's going to love that. <laughs> well, yes. Hey, Tam, give Tamar Champlin, everybody. Let's do lightning. Oh, good. Okay. This one? Which, yeah, it's the one that Rob just used. It seemed like it was working. I don't know. Is it this one? Okay. Hi. Could have been working, clocking in overtime. Could have been chasing all my nickels and dime. Could have been working for what they say is mine. I should have been chasing rabbits to the finish line. But tonight I'll be trading in all the things that I'm not. For all the things that you got I, I got lightning in this bottle And the rent is all paid up on this here room If, if we, we were, were doing, doing what we ought to I wouldn't be yelling at the moon I would Should have been holding my cards to my chest. I should have scored higher on somebody else's test. I could have been something, I must confess. I really don't care if you think my life's a mess. Cause tonight I'll be trading in all the things that. For all the things that you got I, I got, got lightning in this bottle And the rent is all paid up on this here room If, if we, we were, were doing what we ought to I wouldn't be here howling at the moon Bet your bottom dollar I'm gonna make you holler You're gonna shout it out when you let me in Won't you get me under your skin I, I got lightning, lightning in, in this bottle And the rent is all paid up on this here room If we Won't were you Open up this bottle There's a world of love in here for me and you If, if it weren't for love and trouble yeah, well, I'll be rich and dying way too soon If, if we, we were doing, doing what we ought to I wouldn't be here howling at the moon That was the three of us. Uh -huh. Thank you. Oh, my Lord. Thank you all. Sorry about this amp, you guys. Or guitar or whatever the hell it is is broken. I'm going to make an attempt at something while it's happening. See if I can get it before it goes all the way. There's a... No, it rested before. That's what killed it last time. Too many old guy naps. Can anybody relate to that? I certainly, I certainly can.
This song I wrote, actually, we're going to get out of the blues for a minute and try to get some, some, something real. Uh, I, we, I, I play both keyboards and guitar. I should have brought a keyboard or another amp or something. But I wrote this right around Desert Storm time, I think it was, when I realized what a, excuse the expression, what a dick that guy was over there. It was a uh, real bad, real bad guy. We, we actually, we played, me and Bobby Kimball and Dave Jenkins from Pablo Cruz, put a band together, which included Tamara and my son Will, and we went and played at a gig in Kuwait and three gigs, four gigs in, uh, in Iraq. And actually, we were, we were, yeah, it was, it was cool. It was a cool thing to do. Cause we met some really cool people. Not necessarily Iraqis, but we met some great Americans that I would have never met walking down the street in Hollywood. That's for damn sure. But really, really, really great guys that really understood what we were up against. And uh, it, was, it was kind of a cool thing. So I wrote this tune around that period of time. And uh, uh, let me see if I can play it if the amp will hold up long enough for it to work. Worship your heroes, your martyrs and saints Someone to help you throw off the restraints To answer the question Who's to blame? Silent civilian wherever they go Sing their songs of praise So many willing to help them fan the flames Silence the teachers, imprison the wise. Arm all your children and close all their eyes. Plaster your picture all over town. Kidnap some hostages, burn a few flags. Make the evening news. Tell everybody that God has chosen you. Light up the candles, load all your guns. Unleash your passion and let it be done. Fight for one book and make everyone read every page. Yeah. Light up the candles, load all your guns. Call on your anger and blame everyone. Everyone's changing while everything's staying the same. How many times do we need to be used Before we all stand up and simply refuse We got the power to make a change History shows the mistakes that we made Time and time again Why should we die because you refuse to bend Light up the candles, load all your guns Unleash your passion and let it be done Fight for one book and make everyone read every page Light up the candles, load all your guns Call on your anger and blame everyone Everyone's changing while everything's staying the same oh. Heaven knows the differences between us are there for color and rhyme. There we go, marching off to prove that you're wrong and I'm always right. Light up the candles, put down your guns. Love doesn't happen until it's begun. Change what you can and let everyone do what they will. Oh. Light up the candles, put down your guns. Love doesn't happen until it's begun. God didn't put anybody on earth to be killed. Oh. Light up the candles, put down your guns. Love doesn't happen until it's begun. Hold on to life and let love make you fall of its will.
I'm going to put this away. I think a few years in Iraq, that song will be passe. We won't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> eh, wrong. Anyway, so we're, you know, we, I'm, I kind of put together a little bit of stuff. We were looking at Mill Valley. We we're sitting in Mill Valley. We're doing these things. All of a sudden, we got a record deal. Ah, here we go. We're ready to go. We've got a record deal now. We, uh, the, the opposite six, pretty much Vietnam was going on. The draft was taking everybody down. That left me and Tim. I was married and had a kid by the time I registered for the draft. Uh, uh, pretty much me and Tim, Tim wasn't going to go in the services. I think a couple, a couple of guys with asthma and a few other things. And we had the sons of Champlin. What was, what was left of the musicians that didn't get either get drafted or went into the service. I think Rob joined the Navy just to get in the band or to do something other than, other than get shot at. So, I mean, that was the, what the way it was in those days. It was, if you just got drafted, it was two years, but it was two years on the front line. If you went in for three years, you got a better shot of staying off the front line and getting a, getting a gig. I know a lot of guys went into the band. I know Dick Rogers, I think the opposite six drummer, went in the band. Different guy, guys did different things. Just to, to they're they're all still alive, so we we all got through it somehow. But uh, it was a, kind of an ugly time, you know what I mean? It was a, it was a, it was a funny thing. A good portion of the guys in my graduating class didn't come back, so it was kind of a bad thing. By the way, there's. Uh, there's, we, you know, we talked about the bands that were that were in Mill Valley in the early days. There's one guy that I think was really very, very instrumental in helping a lot of these musicians along, and this is uh, my high school music teacher who's sitting right here, Mr. Bob Greenwood. Everybody, <laughs> Mill Valley owes him for. If you want to talk about about musical legacy, this guy. I mean, we you had Bill Gibson. Bill, Bill Gibson went through your classes? Huh? Yeah, Bill Gibson started on drums. Bill Gibson plays with the uh, Huey in the News. He's a great drummer, really good musician, too. Great piano player. And a uh, good singer, also. And uh, George Duke. We all know about George. George was, uh, was a, uh, a mill. And now Bob Greenwood, he did things with my, my sister was, was a couple, three or four years in front of me. And she was a really good opera singer, believe it or not. And Mr. Greenwood would put together pieces of music that were, I mean, this is, you know, okay, we got the blues, we got simple, we got pop. We've looked at all that. What he kind of brought to the ball game is let's try something cool. Let's try something. I remember when you brought in, uh, uh, who was the guy? The guy, it, it was, there was no bar lines. There was no time. There was no nothing. The guy that used to own uh M-O-N-Y uh, insurance company, uh, Charles Ives. He brought in to the, to the choir, he brought in Charles Ives music. <laughs> and, and everybody's going, oh, the choir, we're going to do Bach, and we're going to do Mozart. And he brings in <laughs> Stravinsky and Charles Ives, and just, you know, stuff that really took some serious paying attention to to pull off. He put up, uh, put up a thing, George Duke and Susie Parker, I think, was on the piano for The Medium, which was a, a, an opera that my sister sang. She was, there were two or three people from through the choir, and, and Sal was the, uh, was the lead, and, and uh, Giancarlo Minotti's the guy that did uh, A Mall and the Night Visitors. Remember the, the, every year they would show that opera on, on TV around Christmas time. And uh, Mr. Greenwood put that up, and we, I mean, we actually ended up taking that, oh, we, I'm saying, I just following and watching it. Basically, just watching George Duke's hands play, but Sal, it really did Sal unbelievable. My older sister really was awesome for her because she got to, you know, really get sink her teeth into something deeper than the normal thing. So, uh, and, and Mr. Greenwood kind of instilled in all of us who went through his classes a thing of like, let's do a project. So when I started the Suns, I brought that to that to that thing. Is let's make this a project. Let's not just have a band and play stuff that's really fun that people can dance to. Let's put music together that's interesting that's going to go someplace. Tim Kane was was grew up with a music teacher in uh, at Drake High School, Perry Smith, who kind of had the same vibe. He, he he was he was you know about taking some chances, and I think. We have this this cool st poppy thing and band thing going on in Marin, and then you have guys like Mr. Greenwood and Perry Smith doing some really cool stuff, making 
taking a shot at really trying to do some interesting stuff and, and really kind of more difficult pieces of music. I mean, some of the girls, you know, the choir crowds, some of the girls in the, in the soprano section are kind of like, what is this? <laughs> you know, they're looking at, at Stravinsky and Charles Ives and, and different composers that are around the bend. I mean, just seriously crazy people that wrote wonderful music, you know, and, and, and we tried stuff that was really insane. It was really crazy. And I think that's one of the things that I brought. Not only did I bring my love for R&B and black music, basically, to, to the sons, I brought this feeling of let's make this a project. Let's make this a thing that we all get in together. And we can't play it now, but we might play it a little better tomorrow and maybe even better the next day. So we always had that, you know, no matter what you're doing, it may be better if you hang for a minute and get with it, you know. So and, and we, we all, a lot of us, Mark Isham was, was uh, for a short period of time, was, in, was at TAM. Mark is one of the top soundtrack composers in the, in the world at this point in the game. If you've ever seen A River Runs Through It, that's all Mark's music. Mark played trumpet with the Suns for a while. It's just like there's there's a thing that has happened here that I hope still happens that people have the have the the wherewithal to go. Let's dig into something. Let's make something really cool. Because I know I've been in the I've been in the in the pop music business, in the fame and fortune. You know, as as Joni Mitchell would say, the the uh, uh, what was the line? She had a, I was a free man in Paris. I felt unfettered and alive. Somebody would come. If I'd go back there tomorrow, but for the work I've taken on, uh, stroking the star maker machinery behind the popular song. That, the minute I heard that line, I went, Joni is a genius. She got it. Nailed it. Totally. Nailed it. And that, was a, that song was about David Geffen. It was, she was supposedly David talking like, hey, man, I didn't have to do this all my life. You know? And, and, and that, that fame thing that is so crazy, if you look at, like, back to, back to, I'd say, the first really big, big band that broke out of here. I mean, there was the Dead, there was the Airplane and stuff like that, but I'd say Creedence Clearwater was probably the first real big, giant hits, one hit after another. John was just on a major roll. And, you, and you, you check out any of those people now, and I think, especially John, you check them out now, and it's like, is anybody home? You know, I mean, th too much, too soon, and for too long. I mean, I, was, I work with guys that, that, that had 20 top 10 or 20 top 5 hits before I even met them. And then I did the next 28 years with these guys and was involved in, you know, another 10 of them, 20 of them, you know. And, and, I, and I started looking at... At these guys, and I'm beginning to realize that the word artist, when you say I'm an artist, you're you're kind of bagging yourself into a self-important little hole that goes nowhere. And I've I've always kind of looked at it as like the the art comes from from you doing your craft. It's the craft that really makes it go. If you look at the art that has hung out, that stayed, that's lasted for centuries and centuries and centuries, it's usually something that it may made to keep sugar in. You know what I mean? That somebody said, well, I'm on, or a pair of shoes that, you know, I looked at songwriting is the same as making a shoe. You know, you, you, you're doing the same thing every day. And what happens is art happens to you but you don't happen to art. Art comes to you when you're really just face to face with your craft and you're dealing with your craft every minute of every day. And that's all you do. And that's all you think about. And that's where you go. And suddenly you'll have a song and it'll go boom. You'll go, shit, where did that come from? And whenever you ask yourself that question, just get on your knees and thank God, because it, that's exactly where it came from. It came from somewhere else. And you were there, and boom, something happened. I wrote a song once. A friend of mine gave me a, a Bruce guy. He's a great writer. He wrote a lot of stuff with Richard Marks and really a good guitar player and a really good b big pal of mine. He handed me what he calls a kernel. It was a cassette with a track that he'd put together on his sequencer. And I liked the track, and it was all going on. And I started writing a little bit about myself, saying, well, you know, okay, I'm going to write what I think is going on with me, what's happening with me, you know, my, my pff, shitty upbringing or whatever I had in mind at the moment. Depends on how much dope I was smoking, you know what I mean? And we'll get around to that in a minute, too. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got big fatties for everybody in the place. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I, I would have, but Mr. Greenwood smoked them all before the, before the night. <laughs> but uh, so where was I before these, before my friends helped me out? But, uh, you know, where was I? I lost it. Oh, yeah, well, I'm writing this song. Thank you, Steve. You, you know, the drummer's got to keep you in time. Thank you, my friend. Uh, at any rate, so I was writing a song, and at some point in the game, it, we got to a chorus, and, and all of a sudden, sounded like a melody to me. And all of a sudden, I went, he started to sing of love just to find it. And, and I, Tamara came walking, and later she said, hey, dinner's ready. What you doing? I said, well, I got this song. I don't know whether it's any good or anything like that. And she just looked at the lyrics, and she said, oh, my God, sing it for me. So I ran the cassette machine, and I sang it for her. And she said, you just wrote the song that every singer is. Not that every singer wants to write, or this, it's not about every singer, but this is what every singer is. He started to sing of love just to find it. And I think that's a lot of what kind of makes songwriters, and somehow we've slipped into songwriting, haven't we? Sorry. <laughs> I have this tendency to just, boop, take a left. It's Mr. Greenwood's fault. <laughs> All his fault. Anyway, the, uh, the, uh, the, the thing is that when you have, when you get something, I mean, uh, how many, are there any musicians, or any, any musicians or writers in the building? Just see some hands. We've got musicians, we've writers. Anybody who has any kind of anything to do with art, and if they don't know this or they don't realize it, it's the craft of the art that allows you to get in the same zip code as where the art lives. And until you do that, you're, you're, you, may, you may have an inspiration, like, a, like when an alcoholic has, a, has a, that one of those nights where it's, oh, I, I, I've seen it all now. I don't have to do this anymore. Or when somebody, you know, occasion. I mean, we can all have one of what the, what the Native Americans call a vision. We can all have one. But what you want is you want those as often as you can get. Like, uh, you know that Joni, when she was writing Free Man in Paris, when she hit that little bit, it, she nailed it so perfect to the wall that she had to be going, wow, <laughs> did I do that? And, and, and I've written a few songs over, the, over some time. I, I, wrote a, I wrote a song, I actually, actually got an R&B Song of the Year uh, Grammy for, uh, for a song I wrote for George Benson. And I had all of the, it was uh, called Turn Your Love Around. And it sounds like an easy phrase, turn, turn your love around, like, just like that. It took me about four days to come up with that five-syllable phrase. And I had the song, everything was there, it would not come to me. And finally, we were doing the demo, and Jay says, what's the title? I said, I don't fucking know. I have no idea. And I, and I said, play it one more time. I'll see if I can get it. And all of a sudden, I went, turn your love around. I looked at the rest of the lyrics, and I went, what took so long? And what, what, looked, what took so long is I thought I could do it. And when I just kind of got in that place where you're not really, you're paying attention and you're putting yourself near it, but you're not going, I want to do this. It's not a control thing. It's a thing that happens. And, and, I, and I think after most songwriters that are really good that know what they're doing, not that are necessarily successful, but that are really good, because there's a difference. We'll talk about success in a minute, because I don't believe what a lot of people think are the actual, what success really is. I don't buy a lot of it sometimes. Anyway, at least in music. But that, that thing just can happen. And, uh, and if you're a songwriter or if you're a, a, a player, a soloist, I think it probably happened to Coltrane almost every night. That guy rehearsed and practiced every day till the day he died, four or five hours on the sax. Scales, brr, every single day. My son, Will, when he was at Berkeley in, in, uh, in Boston, he practiced four, four and a half to five hours a day, like, clockwork. He was like not interested and, and the neighborhood piano teachers were doing nothing for him. They were boring him to tears. How many times can you play Go Tell Aunt Rhody? You know, give me a break, you know. I got him with one of the top jazz piano players in the world who's one of the best teachers in the world and this kid was playing Bill Evans within a month, but he did it like this. He practiced four or five hours a day. So he just does his craft all the time and boom, he gets... He barely made it out of high school. He got into Berkeley. He was on the dean's list for the last three years he was there. He, and, he, and he saw all these kids with, you know, 
sitting out there smoking dope in front of 50 Mass Ave and talking about, my oh, my, I'm going to get a band and this, that, and the other thing. Meanwhile, he's down there, Bartok. Okay, let me see, Bartok, Hannon, Cherney. Okay, now, and it was Terry Trotter who was his teacher. And Terry, I got him there when he was about sophomore or junior in high school. And Terry says, I never do kids. Kids just don't work. Kids ain't having any, but I got a feeling about this guy. And, uh, and, uh, and boom. In a month, he's playing Bill Evans charts. He's, he's got the real book, which is like the fake book, except it's the real songs, with all the, all the great chord changes and everything like that. And he's just reading this shit right off the page. Like it's the fly shit is like gone. You know, I mean, unbelievable when you get that inspiration to go somewhere and do something. Bam. I had a guy come out to tune my piano. And this is after Will had been working with Terry and he'd been in Berkeley. He came out to tune my, I had a Yamaha Grand, a medium Grand, and he came to tune the piano. He says, man, I've been tuning pianos for 25 years, and I've never had to say this to anybody. I said, what's that? He says, you need new strings. <laughs> On a piano? <laughs> he says, I never even heard of that. He says, yeah, you've got to restring this piano. It's going to cost about $4,000. I sold a piano. I said, somebody said, man, the piano sounds good. He said, oh, well, until they start popping, you know. And Will had just, had just beat the shit out of it, just like nailed it for uh, for, you know, four or five years. I mean, and I never played it that much. I mean, I've probably practiced for four hours in my whole career, let alone every day, you know. I mean, it, it's sometimes that's what it takes to really get, and it's, and it's a, that, it, at that point, it's not about art. It's about craft. It's about having that much faith in the craft to take you to where the art lives. And, and if you do it, if you, if you treat it with kid gloves and you, and you really, be, you know, believe in how sacred that is, that, that kind of work ethic and that kind of forward motion. Man, when I, I saw that happen to my kid when he was right between the ages of about 16 and about maybe for, for the next 10 years, unbelievable. It was like watching a, you know, you ever seen a, a flower grow but on, on fast film where it just goes, that's what it looked like. I was like, oh, my God. And then he just sits and say, what do you, hey man, can you, can you come play some jazz, you know, some jazzy kind of stuff on something for me? And he just sits down and just, boom, nails it. He sounds like, a, you know, he sounds like Herbie Hancock or something. This is a kid that was playing Go Tell Aunt Rhody and, and, and refusing to practice that, you know. It, and, it, and what it took was a teacher that will spark your interest in what you're doing and, and inspire you and make you happen. And that's what Terry Trotter did with him. And that's what I think Bob Greenwood has done to a handful of musicians that have come through his, through his world. He, I mean, I remember you were explaining one day how flats and sharps, how, why this key was, in, was flat and this one. And then it was just for the flats, you go up a fourth, up a fourth, up a fourth. For the sharps, you go up a fifth, up a fifth, up a fifth. Oh, it, it, I'd been around music. I had been a member of the Musicians Union for a couple of years when, I, when it finally dawned on me. I went, oh, I, I got it. This is math. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I got it. And, I'm, you know, it's just one of those things. Where, you know, the, the, when you have one of those moments where it just goes, boop, and everything opens up and you're into the next, you're in the next world. Very much like, well, let's, here's, let's go to the next part. Mill Valley, Marin County, the 60s. LSD, marijuana, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that opened, that took the music scene and, and put it, it kind of kicked in the four barrel on that thing. It just went, you know, suddenly everybody was just off and running and into it. Around that period of time, we were all getting into, into headphones and listening to Sgt. Pepper, which was a brilliant piece of music, uh, which was, there were five Beatles at that point of the game. Because if you listen to that record now, you go, George Martin is a bad boy. I mean, th he brought that kind of stuff to, the, to, this, to this pop music. And that's where I think a lot of pop music has a way of, of just really talking to you when that kind of, when that kind of project uh, motivation is, is, is applied to it. You, you hear it on uh, a lot of different things. Like I, even the Rolling Stones' Satanic Majesties, which is not... You know, it's not their biggest album by any means, but it's definitely really, really cool. You could tell that a lot of this kind of big project, we're going to make this thing this big. And that's, that's kind of what I've always liked. And, I, and when I saw, like, for instance, Chicago, when I saw them saying, no, we got to come back. We got to, we got to not try to do that anymore. We got to come back. We got to, you know, I think mediocre is where we want to be. It was like when I started going, ugh. You know, I got in there to I got in there to because of the the striving for excellence, not 
not settling for mediocre. Anyway, that was that. That was then, and that's what that was about. But uh, but what happened here in in San Francisco scene? I mean, we got uh, the Suns. Pretty much, we got into acid and uh, and and you know smoking weed and all that kind of stuff. A little bit later than the rest of the the rest of the scene of dead the dead the airplane and all that kind of thing. The Marin County people were still over here hanging out at Marin Joe's, you know, living on you know Caesar salad and raviolis with meat sauce. Which, by the way, is still the best. It's the first place we went when we got here. <laughs> anyway, so the, the, uh, the, what that did to start with was really a cool thing. Something really opened up in a lot of the bands. And, and I know with, with the Sons, boom, my songwriting, it just instantly took off. Because I was at that point, up to that point, I'd been pretty much working my way into a pretty major situation with alcohol. Uh, I was drinking a lot. I was a pretty much unhappy guy. Married way too young. Uh, still hanging on for dear life, just trying to keep the band going, trying to do this, and just boozing regularly all the time. You know, cigarettes and and gin was going on all the time. And and boom, something hit me. I mean, I, you know, we, we had some talks with different people and took took that, that one hit of LSD that went, whoa. Now I see what you're talking about. Now I got a vibe of what's going on. And that happened two or three times out of the 200 times I tried it, the two or three times that it really did the trick. It really opened it up. It really made something happen. Had I left it alone at that point, it would have been the perfect thing to do. But of course, no. The word more came in. So it was more, 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 more. Suddenly, cocaine. Boom, over with. And all of a sudden, it was, it, it became, I mean, at least for me, and this is maybe just, you know, this is not really an AA meeting, but I'm just going to take it there for, yeah. Hi, I'm Bill. Hi, Bill. Yeah. But uh, uh, th th that, that kind of thing basically kind of, uh, there was some great stuff going on in that point of view. And then all of a sudden, it just turned into more. Do, do more gigs, do more gigs. Uh, telling myself I was successful because I was making double scale in the, in the sessions. I would, you know, in a four or five year period of time, I must have done 300 albums. I was just driving from one session to the next. And basically, uh, what, the, the dream that I had to become a, a, a singular star wasn't happening. It just wasn't going on. Songs that I had for my record was ending up on other people's records, and they became stars. But in the meantime, in order to make the rent, I was doing a lot of dates, and I was working out, and I was arranging most of the stuff on dates. So after, after a little, and it was like something that I fell into as a, as a fallback position, sort of. And the next thing I know, 10 years later, I'm going, damn, I'm good at this. I've, I've, been, I've, been, I've been working with enough good singers and arrangers and myself, and I've picked up so much about, you know, working with David Foster, it's kind of hard to walk out of a session if you're paying attention and not, being, you not have learned a lot of good music. He's a great, great, great producer. Uh, crazy as, as hell, but an unbelievably great piano player and great producer. So I was working with him on a regular basis, so we, we did all that, and I, and I just picked up a lot of great ideas, and then I just started taking off on my own. Once again, with that thing of like, let's take this song. We did one one time where there was four singers, most of whom I, I don't, didn't really work with, you know, me and three other singers working for Julio Iglesias. And they had that song, Wise men say only fools rush in. I can't help falling in love with you, or whatever the lyrics are. And, I, and, and the producer said, uh, hey, what do you say we just sing unison with the, with the, you know, with the lead singer, with Julio? And I'm saying, yeah, it's a cop out, man. Let me let me write up a like a madrigal. Let me write up this a, a total piece that you know with counterparts and let me just go to the piano. Give me 20 minutes and then let me put something together. So I did, and we got to the microphone. Of course, the first pass we didn't get. He said, "Oh, let's go back to unison." I said, "No, man, give me a minute. Let me you know put down your gavel. Give me a chance to pull this off." And we ended up getting you know we got the title tune of the record. It was all happening. We you know it ended up being just sweet as could be. Because I, you know, I had to talk him into making a better him making a better record and patting himself on the back, which he was doing. He's going, ah, oh, people think I'm a genius. Then we charged him. <laughs> he was really pissed. <laughs> he went after Rosemary Butler like crazy. Rosemary says, "We just made this your title song on the album." You know. Anyway, neither here nor there. That stories over and over and over again. A million, a million studio stories. But I think for for the most part, that that was once again. 
if you you know if you don't get what you if you don't if you don't get art then just keep doing the craft because it has a certain level of self-satisfaction also the craft i think is is probably and once again it's the same situation now i go into my own studio and i'm working on my own stuff because the the music business is gone there's nothing there's hardly anything left of it it's just it's just dick what happened? You know, nobody knows quite what happened. Probably, you've seen a Tower Records or a warehouse lately? You know, there's no, there's no commerce involved in it, so a lot of people are stopping. A lot of people are just going, well, let's just play live gigs and let's sell our old records and let's do this and let's do that. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here going like, I, I don't care. I got to do what I got. I got to make music and I, and I, I got to make it good. And, and, you know, the striving to try to do something. So what's happening in a weird sort of way now is that the, if you see somebody putting out an album now, you know they're not doing it because they're expected to make a lot of money. It ain't going to happen. But if they are doing it and they know what they're doing, they're probably doing it because of the love of it. That means that that record may may be better than it was when they were making money, because they're only doing it. They only they're doing it just for the sake of doing it, just for the love of it. I know Jay Graydon and Randy Goodrum uh, think they have a thing called J and R, and uh, and it's like here's Steely Dan and here's these guys. They're way up in this world, and it's so great to see. You know, there's a few projects out here. You know, you go. Well, what is this whole world? It's just Katy Perry and and Lady Gaga and what is happening to the you know, and the Voice and you know although the Voice kind of did well for my son, Will was like he came in number three on uh, on a well, the fifth I think the fifth season. He was you know they gave him a car. What can I say? <laughs> now he's trying to live the, live down the fact that he was on the Voice, <laughs> but for the for the while there he was doing really well. It was really cool, kicking everybody's ass. But. Uh, but at some point of the game, you, you, if, if anybody's doing music at this point of the game, the reason they're doing it is because they love it and, or because they just damn well have to. And if, if, and if I'm, you know, I mean, I'm basically semi-retired. I, I have no reason really to go out and work a lot, although I'll take a gig. Somebody wants me to come sing the songs I'm known for, for doing or for writing or for singing. I'm there. I'll play the gig. Give me some bread. I'll take it home. But I'm not, I'm not actively jumping out there trying to fill my whole year with, with dates of what I call formerly of dates. You know, I mean, it doesn't mean anything to me. It's... It's it's to, to other people it's great it's their whole life it's what's going on but man I got I play the guitar I play the keyboards I write great you know I write songs all the time why isn't that what I'm doing you know because I'm, I didn't never really got myself known as a great producer or a David Foster or a you know a Quincy Jones or something like that but it, it's still it's even though those things might not be coming to me at that level i'm still doing it anyway i don't care and i think that that you know every every piece of music i've heard lately that's knocked me out has had no money attached they're not selling records but boy there's some good stuff out there go on google a guy named jacob collier one of these days on just and you know, it'll come up with a with a, with youtubes of about maybe six or seven of this guy's stuff and there's like there's like six little boxes with him singing each part in each one of the boxes and the guy is so unbelievably great it's scary he may he's like he's taking gene perling and high lows all the way up to take six he makes take six sound like the mamas and papas i swear to god this guy's voicings are through the roof great and i you know people just look at me like do you need to be that excited over somebody else's music and i said yes if it's that good dirty loops anybody know that band anybody heard of those guys google that group that's a that's a trio from sweden the singers like Stevie Wonder's new favorite singer, and he kicks Stevie's ass. This guy's unbelievable singer, and then he plays like Herbie Hancock. He's just there's stuff out there that that's so now and happening, and, and it's and it really kind of reminds me of when the Suns were first going. We did our first couple of albums. It was like people were going, "Whoa, where did this come from?" I don't know what it, it's. I don't know if it'll ever get on the radio, but it sure is cool, you know. And I and I and I see that happen to, to different people at different times, and that's when I realize these people. I know the guys in Dirty Loops, about 30 years old, 31, 32. They've all been the top session guys in Sweden for doing other people's records. Good readers, good musicians, well-trained. And they put a trio together, and it's just 
off the chain. And their first songs that they did were covers of Britney Spears and Justin Bieber songs. But they arranged them to the where you'd never recognize them as that. But it got them two, three million hits on YouTube. And got them, you know, got them a record deal, got them things going. You know, they're, they're doing pretty, they're doing a lot better now than they were doing a while back, you know. And, and it's just, there's, there's good music to be found. You just got, it, it's not coming at you the way it used to. So, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, that's what I, what I, when I, when I first started working a lot in Marin County, uh, the, the reason I loved it is that everybody was at everybody else's house writing songs all the time. And it was like, oh, I want to go over to Pat's and write a tune. I sent him a cassette in the mail. And I say, here's a guitar thing with a, vo with a vocal. I don't have any lyrics. And he called me back and he, he sang me a B section of a song called Tri Time Will Bring You Love. It's one of my songs. And, and I just said, wow. He just sang it over the telephone. I was at his house in about 15 minutes and we re wrote the rest of the song. I still perform the song. I still do the tune. The thing's 30 years old, 35 years old. And, uh, and Pat's one of my all-time favorite writers. And uh, it's like, but that stopped happening here. I moved to L.A. Why? Everybody was at everybody else's house writing songs all the time. That's what was happening in L.A. when I moved there, which was the late 70s and, uh, and early 80s, or mid-70s to early 80s. Around that time was Steely Dan, Earth, Wind & Fire, Toto, uh, Boss Gag's record, uh, Silk Degrees came out. My rec my couple of records came out. Every record that came out was so damn musical and cool and bitching and just moving in such a direction. And then every all the bands got popular and all of them started going out and they all just started writing with each other instead of other people. And all of a sudden I was like, well, this isn't going on. And then there was a, around 2005, I went over and did, a, did an album in Nashville. And all of a sudden I looked at everybody was at everybody else's house writing songs. We moved to Nashville, you know. And then, but the problem is when we moved to Nashville, we got there, I was on the road with Chicago so much I hardly had any time to really access the town. And by the time I got back, the town had, had fell into one of their, we're going to go back to straight country because enough of this damn pop shit, you know. It was like, it was a backlash thing. I think Martina McBride put out an album of Patsy Cline and, and uh, Loretta Lynn covers and boom, all of this stuff that Rascal Flats and all of these other groups had kind of built it into this really cool pop. I guess there was a violin on it and there was an occasional steel guitar, but it was still really, really nice, well-crafted records, really cool stuff. Even Shania Twain's record is awesome. I, mean, it's, I, I don't know what it, not, she's not my favorite singer, but it was just a cool production and it was all going on. But all of a sudden, everybody was just writing by themselves and there was a little click here and you can get in that and couldn't get in that. I went back to L.A. just because I like the food. And I didn't have as bad allergies in Los Angeles, so it was like that. Anyway, I've, I've, I've been digressing, and I've been going through all kinds of different stuff, and I hope you guys really enjoyed what's going on. Does anybody have any questions about anything other than my shoes? <laughs> yes, sir. I know some of the guys. I've met one or two of the guys. But have you seen the movie? That was a great movie. Hal Blaine is one of the funniest human beings on the earth. <laughs> he's just, he's a guest. And the, the Wrecking Crew was the band that they played all of the Beach Boys records. And the Beach Boys were very unhappy about it. But Brian Wilson went, I got to have these guys. These guys are going to play these, these records a lot better. So the Beach Boys learned the parts. But when you think about it now, I mean, not so much now, but say in the 80s, late 70s, 80s, almost up through the 90s, all the guys that were on all the records was Toto. It was, it was you know, David Page on piano, uh, or David Foster. It was any two of the Davids, or maybe even David uh, Grusin. You know, there's, one of those three Davids was going to be on every record in town. Jeff Percaro played on virtually, probably, before he passed away, it was probably 10,000 records. Easy. I mean, with those guys... Did, Jeff did uh, quadruples every day. It was the same thing with the Wrecking Crew. It's just the next. It was the next generation of badasses. But I don't. I don't. I don't know those guys. But boy, they sure made some good records in their day. You know, Carol Kay was a great bass player, and you know, Glenn Campbell was one of the original. Remember when we did the the commercial, the Levi, the White Levi's stuff? That was all Glenn Campbell. Yeah, Campbell, Jerry McGee, all those things. You know, they paid us fifty bucks each. We thought we were doing well. It was a national final. You know how much those guys got away with? About 100,000 bucks. That was ours. <laughs> yeah, 
we got we got fried. Once I saw what was going on, I realized, oh, we got fried on that one. You know, we were happy to hear ourselves on the radio. You know, hey, they could have given us a Cadillac. It would have been even better. Yeah. We we finally on the radio. Let me see. Let me, I can remember it. Surfers and twisters go for white Levi's. Even their sisters go for white Levi's. Hootin' nanny singers go for white Levi's. All the real swingers go for white Levi's. Ooh, ooh. Uh, white Levi's are the pants for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know the song I sang earlier, the real pretty one? I still got to read it. But what do I remember? That shit. <laughs> <laughs> is that unbelievable? <laughs> I didn't do Shasta. I did a, I, actually, I did a, a, a puppy chow commercial one time. Uh, there was one where the, 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 they were saying, something's wrong with the dog because he's really awake, and, the, do, and, he, and the, the vet's got a stethoscope on this little dog. And there's this little, I feel good, I feel right. It's just this funky thing. You're hearing through a stethoscope. Now, Greg Fillingaines, who was Michael Jackson's piano player on all his records, he, it was, I'm in a Ralph's grocery store, it was like a Safeway, and all of a sudden he starts singing me that song, and, and I said, hey, Greg, what are you doing? He says, man, I knew that was you. <laughs> Through a stethoscope? He said, yeah, I could even tell then it was you. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Bill. Yes. First of all, I just want to say, um, yes. Oh. In the mic. Well, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Ladies, stand up. Stand up, stand up. Deborah is the person to talk me into doing this and coming up here to see all you guys. <laughs> now, Deborah has a has a has a, a, a service basically to take people on hikes up on Mount Tam. If you don't know your way around Mount Tam, that's the person to talk to. She's really good at it, and she's she did the, uh, the what do you the call oral it? interview the you. oral interview thing. Yeah, yes. we did. We we were Skype buddies. We're yes. Skype pals. Whatever stories he doesn't tell tonight, you'll catch on the interview. If yeah. you listen to it. Um, but yeah. I do have a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Can you explain to, uh, you told me in the interview, but some people don't know why the band is called Sons of Champlin. <laughs> What's the meaning behind that? I think, you know, I think that there was a movie out, The Sons of Katie Elder at the time. And my, uh, there was just like a week or so where I was already married and had a kid, and most of the guys in the band hadn't even started dating yet, so they were calling me, for, they were calling me Father Champlin for a while. Bless you, my son. Let us pray. But, uh, uh, you know, and the, then the original name of the band was the Master Beats, and we couldn't get any gigs with that. <laughs> that was Tim's idea. It wasn't mine. That was Tim that did that, or Terry, one of the Well, let's blame it on Terry. Why? He's not here. Yes, sir. Hey, oh, cool. Yeah, that was the only good year at TAM was the 65. Uh, do you remember uh, singing The Nighttime is the Right Time at the Irwin Street Warehouse? Yeah. I think that was the opposite six, I think. Yeah. Or the triodes. It's actually a Ray Charles tune. Oh, yeah. Great, yeah, great and song. And John Leonis used to, <laughs> used to put, a, he put a shawl on and go, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, a qu quick question. <laughs> we actually stole the beginning of that for one of our songs. One of the first songs I ever wrote was actually a blues. Uh, Bill, the album No Wasted Moments, is that possible to get that anywhere? No Wasted Moments was, was like an EP, really. It was like five songs, four or five songs. Oh, it wasn't a full album. Uh, no, LP. it wasn't a full album. And uh, a friend of mine, Joey Carbone, who's, who we have always considered the, the Japanese connection. Joey gets everybody signed to Pony Canyon or whatever labels are on over there. And, and he had a song he wanted me to sing in the studio. You know, hey, I'll give you 500 bucks. I said, sure, I'll take the five. And went and sang this song called The City. Remember? Da, da, I remember da, that. Da, 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 da. Him and Michelle Hart wrote together. And, uh, and so I did the song, and he got it placed on an ad uh, in Japan for, uh, I think it was for, for like heaters, portable heaters, 
where I think Charlie Sheen was in the ad with a with an overcoat or some craziness. I can't even remember what it was. But over there at that time, unless you got on a on a, a soap opera or an ad, you're you're or you were a big giant group like a you know Mariah Carey or Earth Wind and Fire or something. Uh, you didn't get on the radio. People didn't hear you unless you ca- had something that was in an ad over there. So he he got the song in an ad. And then he called me and said, dude, we got to write some song. We need to do, at least do an EP because the, the, the uh, Warners over there wants it. I just got off the phone with, uh, with the president of Warners in Japan. So with the, we, how quick can we do it? So we knocked it off in about three weeks. And we wrote it and, and got it done in about three weeks. It was Dennis Belfield on bass, Carlos Vega on drums. Carlos was a, was a drummer with, uh, with James Taylor for years. And then, he, and then he sadly passed away. He shot himself. And he just, I think it was one of those Prozac moments. That stuff can either, it'll, it'll either make you or break you, one or the other. One, it'll make you feel better. Two, you're just suicidal as can be. And I think that's what happened with Carlos. It just, it just took him out. Uh, and then uh, Kevin Dukes was the guitar player on it. And that was basically the band. And we used, I think uh, Bobby Caldwell was singing backgrounds on some of it. It's a good album. It's a good little, little thing. One tune on it. Actually, the no wasted the, the song "No Wasted Moments" was a, was a cool was a cool little ballad that I wrote. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for you, do you have that record? Yeah, I think it's a I think it's an Amazon thing. Anybody got another question? We'll get a couple out of it. The Deacons. Now, the Swingin' Deacons was John Cipollina on guitar. Joe, I can't, Joe, somebody was the bass player. Remember Joe? Steve Regalia was on drums, and Adam Foreman was on piano. Adam was another guy that really was, that really was a great Mill Valley musician. He played every instrument. I forgot to talk about Adam. Adam was great. He, he, did, he did stuff for me. I was about 14. I remember I was walking down the street with him. And and uh, and and we were just hanging out. I was just hanging out with him. Adam was a UPS guy. He worked for UPS, huh? Yeah, it was a mailman. And it was just a, he was a, he played great drums. He played great piano. Played great guitar. Sang bitchin', and he was the nicest guy on the earth. Really sweet guy. And I remember we were walking down the street, and we ran into this guy Ed Booth, who was a, who was another guitar player in town. And and Ed said to Adam, and I'm I'm like 14 years old, 15 years old. And uh, the, guy, the guy said to, uh, Ed said to Adam, he says, man, we really need to get a piano player. And Adam just said, why don't you get Bill? And he says, well, can he play? I said, yeah, yeah, he plays great. You should get Bill in the band. And boom. The first time I ever went on a stage, I went with Adam with the Swingin' Deacons over to Sausalito Women's Club. I must have been 14 because I, I knew Pete Cyril's and Pete knew the, the uh, Cipollina family. So John Cipollina was in the Swingin' Deacons also. And I remember we were at the uh, we were at Sausalito Women's Club, and I'm in the wings watching the band play, and John had an extra guitar. It was like a bass or baritone guitar, and he says, "Hey, Bill, come here, play it." He just handed me the guitar, and I played the rest of the set with him that night. And it was John Cipollina, the first guy that ever took me on stage. John was the sweetest guy, the nicest guy. He played with Quicksilver Messenger Service. Remember John with the big, looked like trombone horns and the a standel and all the rest of the craziness? Awesome, awesome guy, really cool guy. Rob, you weren't in the Deacons, were you? Who was, who was the bass player in the swing in Deacons? Did you play with him? It was Rob that was in the band. No wonder. I know it wasn't Joe. Joe was in the Falcons. Really? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. And your neighbors were real happy with that. Yes, sir. Winston was, and, and, and Pete Searles, uh, Winston's little brother, littlest brother. First time I played, I think at Edna McGuire at a talent show, it was me and Pete. I was playing guitar and Pete was playing drums. Pete was a good little drummer. And, and Tamara was saying, well, where is he now? And I said, you know, I don't even know. I lost touch with the Searles like way, way long before. I don't even know. Oh, wow, most likely, yeah. 
Yeah, Adam. Adam was really, really cool. He was very, very helpful to me. And then, and then I think it was Rob that told me he, he actually was living way out in the country in Oregon, and uh, and somebody went out to visit him, and apparently he'd been gone for, you know, he was he would he'd been dead for like a month or something. He nobody. He just kind of ended up by, all by himself, and it just was it never felt right to me. He's just like he was so great. He, you remember how great he sang? He was a good singer. Great guitar player. It just he just had a cool vibe, man. He, he'd make all these, you know, the Ronnie Hawkins kind of tunes. And they'd make them all just, you know, my babe, don't stand no cheating, my babe. He was cool. He was a great singer. I'm afraid we have to cut it off right at this yeah, point. Yeah, we got to cut it off. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so thanks. first of all, good. Come on. hey folks, thank you very much. Okay. So, thank you, thank you, Bill, it's Tamara. Don't if you forget, could all guys, Tamara's selling CDs over there. Buy them or you'll die. Please. And if you could also help stack the chairs up while bringing the racks up. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Bill.